the book of Exodus, chapter 15. Then, that is, after being freed from slavery and crossing the Red Sea to freedom, then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. His picked officers were sunk into the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You sent out your fury. It consumed them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. But you blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples heard. They trembled. Pang seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. Trembling seized the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. By the might of your arm, they became still as a stone until your people, O Lord, passed by, until the people whom you acquired passed by. You brought them in and planted them on the mountain of your own possession, the place, O Lord, that you made your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. When the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his chariot drivers went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then the prophet Miriam Aaron's sister took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. <coughs> the same passage in Hebrew. Ahaz Yashir Moshe Uvne Israel Et Ashira Hazot Ladonai Bayam Ruhule Mor Ashir Ladonai Kiga Hoga Sus Feroch Vor Ahamavayam Ozi Vezim Ratia Vahilili Shuha Zeli Vehan Vehu Elohea Viva Arom Menhu Adonai Ihish Milchama Adonai Shemo Markevot Paro Vehelo Yarahavayam 
ומבחר של אישה אהבת ובבי ים סוף. תהומות יחס יומו, ירדו ועם סלות כמו אבן. ימינך אדוני נעדרי בכוח, ימינך אדוני תרעץ אויב. וברוב גאונך תהרוס כמך, תשלח אחרונך יאכלי מוקקש. וברוח אפיך נערמו מים, ניצבו חמוני נוזלים, קפאו תהומות בלב ים. אמר אויב, ארדוף אסיק אחלק שלל, תמלא אמו נפשי, אריק חרבי, תורישנו ידי. נשבת ורוחך כיסם אויים, צללו כעופרת במים אדירים. מחמוך באלים אדוני, מי כמוך נהדר בקודש, נאור התהילות, עושה פלא, נאור התהילות, עושה פלא. קירבה סוס פרעה ברכבו ובפרשיו בים. וישב אדוני עליהם את מי הים, ובני ישראל הלכו ביבשה בתוך הים. ותיקח מרים הנביאה, האחות אהרון את הטוב בידה, ותצאנה כל הנשים אחריה בתופים ובמחולות. וטען להם מרים, שירו לאדוני כי גאו גאו סוס ורוכבו רמה וים. This is the witness of God's people. And it's a witness of jubilation and victory. And it's a witness of vengeance and gratitude, devastation and power, fear and awe. I have not had such mixed feelings since I was about 10 years old. At the summer camp that my brother and I attended, a week-long color war was one of the summer's highlights. The whole camp was divided into two teams, and we would compete in sports, knowledge quizzes, arts, music. We'd even get points for our team if we cleaned our bunk really well. And one summer, my beloved younger brother and I got placed on opposite teams. And that year, my team won, and my brother's team lost. And I could not deal with feeling so happy and so sad at the same time. So I cried for hours. Or it might be more accurate to say that I have not had such mixed feelings since my mother died. I was glad that her suffering ended, and I was devastated that mine was just beginning. And I had such a hard time dealing with relief and grief at the same time that I cried every day for a year, give or take a few weeks. It is not easy to deal with this biblical text, this great poem that some call the Song of the Sea. And as this poem moves between jubilation and vengeance, it evokes all the beauty and all the terror that's associated with confronting a huge body of water. And I would like to just stand here and cry, but I think that's not what Beth asked me to do. 
And I know that I am not the first person, that we are not the first people to be moved in conflicting directions by this spiritual poem. And so there are resources to deepen our understanding of the poem and to deal with our own responses. And it helps me to turn to midrash. That's a Hebrew word, midrash. It refers to the body of interpretation and legend developed over centuries of Jewish tradition. Literally, midrash means deep inquiry. And some of the stories and teachings that make up the Midrash are as old as the biblical text itself. And as far as we know, they just didn't get chosen to be in there. But some of the stories in the Midrash are, as, are newer stories that respond to questions we raise about the text. And in synagogue and in Hebrew school, Jewish religious school, we learn Midrash right along with Torah right along with the Bible. Sometimes we're so connected to the Midrash that we could swear it was actually in the biblical text, even when it's not. So I'll share with you three wonderful legends from the Midrash. One about unity, one about enmity, and one about hope. Toward the beginning of the Song of the Sea, Moses and all of the Israelites declare as if in one voice, this is my God and I will praise God. But think about it. In every other biblical story about this group of people, they are contentious in their faith. They lack faith in one another. They lack faith in God. Even normally when they see a miracle, they fall apart and they run away. How could it be in this moment of crossing the Red Sea, this moment of turmoil, how could they suddenly declare their faith in unison? Well, because says the Midrash. It wasn't really in unison. In fact, everyone saw something different that they named as God. Some people saw a warrior God who defeated an enemy army. And some people saw a maternal God who drew them into new life through the watery birthing canal of the Red Sea. And this Midrash, this legend, really just amplifies the biblical text itself, which actually describes the crossing of the Red Sea in at least four different ways, all mushed together in that account of the story. And it acknowledges that people had very different experiences. One way, Moses spoke to the people, reasoned with them, and they chose to walk into the water. Number two, Moses, the skilled magician who seemed to know physics and all the specialized laws of energy matter connections, held out his magic wand and split the sea. Number three, God blew a puff through the divine nostrils. I love that image, the giant divine nostrils. To help a particular group of people who were in mortal danger. Number four, I'm not making this up. It's right in the biblical text. Luckily, the weather cooperated that day. The east wind rearranged the waters and the Israelites took advantage of us. And so our Midrash tells us it actually does not matter what the people saw. Some of them were theists. Some were agnostics. 
Some were still atheists. Some, even in that moment, were still skeptics. Some were militarists. Some were feminists. Some were scientists. But everyone agreed. We were on the verge of death, and something amazing has happened. Everyone said, I see the power of my God. I see this power as I know it. And instead of everyone seeing something different, dividing the people, as it so often does, it brought them together. Somehow they were united in their awe and their gratitude and their joy. And that put all the old divisions between them into a new perspective. At that moment, as they moved together from death to life, everything they used to argue about was simply not important. And they all knew it. <coughs> and the rejoicing is beautiful. But from another perspective, it seems misplaced. It seems wrong. Because in the poem, Moses and the people say, I will sing to God because God has thrown Pharaoh's horse and rider into the sea. Not the horse that Pharaoh himself was riding. He was back in his palace giving his crazy orders. But the horse that was ridden by a young soldier now, how really could the people rejoice about this? Because surely they knew, as we, the readers, know, that all of the Egyptians, even including Pharaoh's closest advisors, all of the Egyptians supported freeing the slaves. No one agreed with Pharaoh's orders to bring them back. And surely, the soldiers who drowned were very young men, reluctantly following their orders because all their training told them they did not have a choice. How could the Israelite people really rejoice at the drowning of these young men? Shouldn't the Israelites feel sorrow for these young men, for these additional lives that Pharaoh threw away in his stubborn quest for power? Yes, says our Midrash, they should have. And no, says our Midrash, they weren't capable of feeling sorry for them. Legend tells us that at the moment of the crossing of the Red Sea, the moment after the crossing of the Red Sea, the angels in God's heavenly court see the Israelites singing in praise of God at the sea. And so the angels join in the song because after all, at least for purposes of this legend, it's in the job description of the angels to praise God every single moment. But this time, this particular time, God does not want their praise. Instead, God scolds the angels. God asks them, what are you, human beings? It's understandable that humans rejoice when their enemies die because humans have bodies. And when those bodies are threatened, human beings are under terrible stress. And if humans overcome or escape the threat, of course they rejoice in their relief. But you, you angels, you do not have bodies to worry about. You are purely spiritual creatures. And you, from that perspective, should understand 
that I, the Lord, value all of my creatures equally. You should understand that when even the littlest creature dies, I do not rejoice. And it hurts me that humans rejoice. But perhaps one day they will evolve beyond their fears and they will live fully into their spiritual nature. And maybe you will help show them the way. When will that evolution happen? A third midrash tells us, sort of. This one is a newer midrash, only about 1,500 years old. That's new in Judaism. This midrash responds to the biblical text as we have it. The Song of the Sea, this great poem, begins with the words, Then Moses and the Israelites sang. In Hebrew, the words for then they sang are az yashir. Az, then, yashir, they sang. And in the grammar of biblical Hebrew, yashir is a past tense verb. They sang, then they sang, is a correct translation of az yashir. But in ordinary spoken Hebrew, and this perhaps will drive you crazy if you try to learn biblical Hebrew. In ordinary spoken Hebrew, Yashir, the same word, is a future tense verb. And az yashir would mean Moses and the Israelites will sing in the future. And so Midrashic thinkers spun a legend around that. When, they asked, when will we sing this song again? And they answered, we will sing it when messianic time is established. Not when a teacher comes to announce the messianic time, but only when the messianic time is fully realized. When people actually come to know that most of the divisions and differences that cause social strife are in the biggest picture, not important. When people let go of the knee-jerk reactions of fear toward one another, and when people learn to connect in a shared spirit, when enmity gives way to unity, when we begin to see as the angels see, and I know that all of you know the most famous and cherished Jewish description of this messianic time, articulated by our great shared prophet Isaiah. Isaiah says, the lion will lie down with the lamb. The cow and the bear will graze together. The calf and the lion cub will play together, and a little child will lead them. The animals represent the inner conflicts within every human being, and the animals also represent the nations of the world. Some of our inner conflicts, as well as the conflicts that divide people are laid out so clearly in the Song of the Sea. But the Midrash teaches that one day we will learn to move past these kinds of conflicts. One day we will learn to heal the psychological, interpersonal, and international conflicts. Our task for this day is to make use 
of our spiritual and educational resources and begin to learn how. Those resources are not far from us. In the language of the Midrash, they are not really in heaven, but they are very close to us. From the world's great wisdom traditions to the newest sociological knowledge about conflict resolution, those resources are closely available. And our task is to grab hold of them and learn how to live into the messianic unity. Thank you.